On this episode of The Pack Leader Show, we talk about where we've been for three months, bite work, muzzles, and aggressive golden doodles. What's going on, Pack? Steve Del Savio from Pack Leader Dogs. We are here for episode four of the Pack Leader Show. Shit, this has been quite some time since we've done the show. We have a lot of stuff we're doing. We have Instagram Live with us right now. We've been talking with them before the show started. So if you're not following us on Instagram, at Pack Leader Dogs on Instagram. We have our YouTube channel, which we repost the, the podcast. We post clips on Facebook and Instagram as well. We've been super busy with a lot of stuff going on. We have a big project in the works. I would love to share what it is, but I don't think it's the best idea to do that just yet. I wanna make sure we have this actually completed and then share it with you guys, which is gonna be like so exciting. We can do a lot more things when this goes through, but we'll keep you guys posted on, the, on what's going on with that. We've been doing a lot of uh, production. We have my man, Adam, which is AFM Beats, right? Is it AFM underscore? at AFM underscore Beats, who's here, who, and his buddy Iro, who do video and photography, and then we've been doing a ton of production of, of content so we can share with you guys. And my, like I said, my goal is just to provide you guys with as much value as I possibly can. I don't, this, this isn't a show that we're trying to promote the company, really. In, in reality, it's a, it's a show that I wanna give back because we're, we're busy as hell. We have, like I was just telling Instagram Live, they were asking if I had any consultations available for private consultations. We're booked basically through the end of the year into next year already for myself. Uh, board and train list is like, a, what, a year long or something right now? At least. So we're, we're trying to meet demand better and get more, um, teach our, te we have trainers here that I'm really working with, but I wanna make sure they're up to a certain level and a certain standard before I put, start putting them out into consultations. Uh, we have one of my guys, Dan, who's been out there helping some people. And we're just trying to keep this thing going and, and try to help as many of you. So the goal of this is I always say I don't want any, uh, I told Instagram this, I said I don't want any, I don't need anything from this podcast. My goal is to just help you guys. Like I feel like, I feel almost a sense of responsibility that I've been lucky enough to learn from some of the best guys in the world or best females in the world as well in the dog training world that I want to be able to give as much as I possibly can back because it's more than just business. This shit is like my passion. I sleep. I, I, you know, I have dreams about this stuff, sometimes nightmares about this stuff, but I, I think about this stuff constantly that why was I given the, the ability or the opportunity to learn all this stuff and be able to help as many people and dogs. So I'm like, I have to help as many dogs. And if my lifetime, I've already said that I'm never gonna retire because I like this stuff too much. So I figure at least knock on wood, if I can live for another 50 years, maybe 70 years, that'd be sick, like with technology. But if I can live for another 50 years, it's a long time, but also a short time in the grand scheme of things of like the existence of everything. But in 50 years, if we can really change the way the, the world sees dogs and they can understand dogs and learn how to live with dogs, we can create a community of people who really, really work together to bring balance to dogs, that's gonna be like the greatest thing ever. What the hell else have we been doing? I've been getting yelled at by Jamie and Cassie pretty much daily for not being on time because I'm constantly doing this stuff and talking to everybody and all you guys. Because this is my most favorite thing to do, by the way, is either in the moments at consultations uh, working with the board and trained dogs and doing this stuff of talking with you guys are, are my three favorite things to do by far. Like when I, when I have to hear something about, Hey, can you read this contract? I want to, that's like the stuff where I'm like, okay, I got to do this, but it's part of being a business owner. So if it means that reading contracts and doing accounting and all that other bullshit and advertising and everything allows me to give time with you guys, then fuck, I'll do that shit all the time if I have to. So with that being that I love you, all you guys on here, Let's get some questions going. All right, let's I haven't start. heard of these questions in a while. Yeah. All right, let's start with our first well, how, Was that too rusty? No. No? Nah, decent? Yeah. All right. It's going good. Are you ready now? Yeah. I'm always ready. Mm, not always. True. Okay. Nikki. Always ready, but oh, always ready. All the time. You're never, you're never always ready. ready, but not always on time. Let's put it that way. Never on time. Okay, never on time. All right. Sorry, people. I'll try to be on better on time. Go ahead. Are you sure you're ready now? No, but go ahead. <laughs> 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 Nikki A270. Steve, do you ever use a muzzle? And then if you do, is it for life? Yes, we definitely use muzzles. We use muzzles a lot. We do with a lot of aggression and stuff um, with humans and dogs. So 
The muzzle gives us the ability, obviously a dog's mouth is gonna be its most powerful, powerful weapon. So we have mouths too, and, but we don't have the same biting power and teeth as a dog. So I gotta do something to take away that, the ability of a dog to really damage another dog or damage a human. So we definitely use that in situations where, let's just say we have a dog who has dog aggression and we start with the muzzle. So we start uh, working, working dogs at a distance from dogs. Something that, I, that I've been reading a lot too or seeing a lot of is this kind of debate on like how to deal with aggression and stuff like that. And there's two sides to it. There's one side of people who are really doing like the fast, fast, fast way of like, to me, which is kind of shutting dogs down of just, just high level punishment and, and, it, and basically not allowing a dog to move or even look at another dog without receiving punishment, which to me is more of suppression, which is not gonna be the most beneficial long term. And then there's the other side of people who are saying that it takes months and months. Of, listen, some dogs it does, but for very easy cases, in my opinion, they're saying that it takes months and months and months and months to do it, where there becomes a fine line there where you're almost allowing a dog to continue that behavior, for which becomes, or, or be, continue those actions that they're doing, which then can become the behavior long term. So the more they practice it, the more permanent it also becomes. So to me, there's there's two, uh, in, in so much of life, but especially in the dog training world, there's two separate sides to the thing that are extremes. To me, what I'm doing in the middle is, I like to let, let dogs figure it out on their timeline, but also not let them practice the behavior for a really long amount of time. So now getting back to the question is, is with the muzzle, the muzzle allows us to work dogs at a distance. Let's say the dog's uh, aggressive with other dogs. I can work the dog at a distance and teach the dog to settle and be calmer, but there's gonna be a time where I have to get them really close to other dogs. So there's a lot of dogs that are labeled aggressive that people think they need muzzles and I don't use muzzles in those scenarios just because I can see and feel the dog and realize that this guy's not here to bite or really attack. He's more of the, the full of shit dog that I call them of like, I'm gonna yell and scream at you, but then I'm not really gonna do anything about it. But then there's definitely dogs that we work with that are like, I'm definitely gonna do something about it and I'm gonna try to really injure you or the other dog in those moments. So those are the ones that I use the muzzle for. Um, I use it to get close to dogs. So this way, if the dog tries to go after and makes a mistake, we have to push them a little bit and put them into scenarios with other dogs so they're not gonna, you know, if I allow them to go in there without a muzzle, one little slight error, and that's a big, big problem. It's a big bite, it's a big injury. So I'll do it to get them past a certain point. And then I never take the muzzle off until I fully trust the dog. So there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of people have a negative um, view of the muzzle. The muzzle is something that's an amazing tool for me, and I, I think it's a very positive thing. So it's how you look at it. If I take a muzzle and I'm, I'm going to put it on a dog and I feel bad and I feel sorry, it's like, oh, this sucks, I have to put this muzzle on you. And it's only related to times where like, I'm taking you to the vet, or it's only related to times where like, uh, like people are coming over to the house and that's the only time it goes on, then of course the, the, the association to the muzzle is gonna be that it's a negative, shitty thing. But if I put it on, I use food, uh, we're gonna make a, a video on muzzle conditioning so people can learn how to do it the right way so the dog actually sees the muzzle and says, nice, the muzzle's coming on, let's put it on because it means good things. It's the same thing that we do with like the remote collar if we do that. I want the, when the remote, remote collar comes out and the dog sees it, that it's like, wow, this is an awesome thing. So. In short, summary is I do use muzzles totally. I think they're a great thing. It helps us get through that gray area where I don't really trust a dog, but we have to start getting them near people or near dogs and into situations where a bite is still possible, but we can still correct it without the damage of an actual bite. So I use them all the time, but the goal is always to get the muzzle off, in my opinion, as soon as possible. That being said, I'm not rushed to get the muzzle off. It's, it's one of those things that's like, I have to have the feeling of I totally trust the dog. Because if I don't trust the dog, then he's not gonna trust me that I have control of the situation. So then it's the, the probability of a bite or an attack is way higher. So remember me as leader, I have to do trust and respect. So if I don't have total trust of that dog, then he's not gonna have total trust or she's not gonna have total trust of me too. So that's a good like summary of the whole thing. Quick, long answer with quick summary at the end. What else, what else do we have? Hope that helped. If there's any other questions, by the way, if I answered your question here and you weren't clear, I want all of you guys to be specific, like very clear. So even if this wasn't your, your, your question, if you have other questions about muzzle, feel free to send us a message on Instagram, Facebook, or email. Yeah, boom. Next. Okay, canine connoisseur says, what's your opinion on bite work? Canine connoisseur, it's like a wine connoisseur, yeah. okay. 
What's your opinion on bite work and personal protection? And would you or would you not own a personal protection dog yourself? What's my opinion on it? It's very dependent on the dogs, you know what I mean? So I think that um, bite work is beneficial. To me, it's all of who's gonna own the dog and where is it gonna be? So if it's bite work stuff and you have, you have someone who's experienced, who's gonna be owning the dog, who understands bite work and understands how to create it and how to stop it, I think it could be a good thing. It's a good outlet for dogs who have that in their DNA to do that. That being said, some of the bite work and protection stuff that I've seen is, how do I say this? Some of the stuff that I've seen, in, in, in my opinion, is creating more insecurity in the dog to make the dog better at that, that bite work and all that stuff. So in some of the bite work things, like when the dog is, is biting a sleeve or doing certain stuff, if the dog breaks the bite, they, they punish the dog for doing that which to me is, I, I know what they're doing in those moments, but this is a very, very tricky subject because here's a perfect example of why. So a good buddy of mine, who's also a trainer of Caesar Milan, his name is Todd, and he just, uh, he just got really, really badly attacked by a Belgian Malinois who was trained in protection and bite work and all that kind of stuff. But in this particular case, when I spoke to Todd on the phone, he's, he's in the hospital and by the way, he's doing great. Um, he had said that the dog was an insecure dog and a very tense dog. So if you have an insecure dog and a tense dog and you teach bite work and all that stuff, you have to be very careful about not creating more insecurity and letting the, the bite work or the protection and the attack be a way to be an outlet for the insecurity, if that makes sense. So I want a dog who's calm most of the time, balanced, who's understands direction, has an on and off switch, who doesn't have insecurity and is, listen, bite work can also increase confidence, totally. So if it's done the proper way, I think it's a good thing, and it is, which is my short answer. The long answer of this is, it's a very tricky subject because you can get dogs out of control very quickly. So in this situation, they taught bite work to a dog who was very insecure and very tense. So when that dog got corrected by my colleague, he just turned around and flipped out and went after him and was a very, very serious attack. So yeah, it's one of those things that, that I don't recommend the public doing. I don't recommend um, the average dog owner doing. Um, I, I do think it's very beneficial for certain people, and I'm sure there's going to be some people in the, in the protection and bite work community that can say that I don't know what I'm talking about. But in my opinion, I think that it's, I think it's a very cool sport. I think it's a good thing if it's done the right way. But I don't know that there's, there's enough people out there that know how to do it the right way, number one. And number two, the, it, it creates almost a weapon. So you're taking a weapon and then giving it to the average dog owner, which can very easily go wrong. So sometimes like I'll see people who get like a German Shepherd and they say, I'm gonna teach him bite work. What I see is a happy-go-lucky middle of the pack dog who just wants to have fun and play. And I'm like, okay, that's, that's great. And then you wanna teach him bite work, but do you really wanna bring that side out of the dog? And are you able to control that side of the dog with the family and kids and all that stuff? Is it possible? Yes, of course, don't get me wrong. You can totally do it, but all that stuff needs to be in place to make sure it's a, it's it's possible to happen. So that's kind of my opinion on that stuff. Yeah. What else? Instagram. Oh, Instagram. Thank you for joining us for the beginning of the show and the end of the show. We'll see you guys soon. I'm gonna do more Instagram lives. I've been busy with these guys breaking my balls doing all this content. So I'll be back to giving you guys Instagram live soon. Awesome seeing you guys. See you guys soon. Still with you guys though. So what else do we have? Okay, uh, Wendy Paseos says, do you think that if people neuter their male dogs, it will improve their behavior? Hmm, that's a good one. So that can go both ways. I've seen people who say, who say that neutering a dog, my dog got so much calmer, but I've also seen people say I neutered him and now he's going after dogs and going after everybody. So to me, that's an event that happens. You're, you're messing with hormones and things like that, right? So the best way for me, is right from the beginning, from puppyhood, to start teaching a, teaching calm and follower state. So if we go into prevention mode, then intervention and things like, when do I neuter them? Uh, are males and males okay? Do they have aggression together? Do females and females, is that a big issue? Um, 
age and all these things, all those things become a factor when you don't go from the beginning of creating calm follower dog. So the goal is always to create balance. So if I'm not creating a balanced dog, then yes, all those things can matter. And it can go either way. You can get a dog who becomes calmer. You could get a dog who becomes more tense, more frustrated, more anxious. But if I was to do it, the, the best possible way ever is from puppyhood, teach calm follower state, put the dog around balanced dogs, old dogs, adolescent dogs, uh, young dogs, high energy, low energy, big dogs, small dogs, ex people, excited people, small people. So everybody, expose them to everything and show them how to be calm and respectful in all those scenarios. Learn how to turn on excitement, learn how to turn off excitement. Then as time goes on, it comes time for neutering. It doesn't really matter at that point, in my opinion, is that there's, there's two conflicting theories on, on it. Of, of There's a side from the behavioral standpoint of people believe that six months is the proper time to do it. So the dog's not experiencing all those hormones and the need to mate and all that kind of stuff. There's other people who are saying that you should wait to at least a year and a half for the bones to fully develop, the joints and all that stuff. So there's no, there's no like total proof either way. I'm kind of like on both sides of it because there's way more that goes into it than just the age. So I'm like, who's raising the dog? If, so like my, my, my friend down in Puerto Rico, uh, Yoa from Palmoli PR, that's his Instagram, by the way, at Palmoli PR, really, 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 uh, really good trainer. He has a, a German shepherd who he did not neuter until I believe over a year old, but he knows what he's doing. He's been exposing this dog to everything. So they, he wasn't really dealing with many issues. It just became that time where he felt that he didn't want that dog to experience the need to mate and he wasn't planning on breeding him. So he, you know, obviously neutered the dog. So that's, that's to me a totally fine scenario. Now, if you have somebody who's getting a powerful dog and they're not following all the stuff, Regardless of neutering or not, the neutering is going to be an event that can go either way. So it's kind of a coin flip, really, in a lot of scenarios, in my opinion. So I would recommend, like I said, instead of putting so much stock into should I, when should I neuter and is that going to change everything or I have a male dog, is it better for me to get a male or a female? Like A lot of those things matter way more when you don't have balance in the beginning. So I would definitely focus on more of the prevention factor of really getting a dog exposed and balanced and socialized to all scenarios, all dogs, all people, and have a good, well-trained, balanced dog. And then you can neuter based on, in your research, what you think is better as far as six months to a year, year and a half, two years, whatever you wanna do. So to me, it would be more of the prevention side of it, understanding that, and then go to that. But yeah, just going to neutering. Neutering is one event that can trigger either way. So I would rather just do the prevention side of things. That would be my opinion on that shit. What else? You're on Facebook Live as well. Facebook Live. What's up, Facebook Live? I was just on Instagram Live. So if you're not following us on Instagram, that's at Pack Leader Dogs on Instagram. Facebook, you guys are awesome. Let's get this shit going too. Are they going to put some questions in there? Yeah, so ask some questions in here. We're, we're live on our, our podcast. We're like four questions in or something, three or four questions in. We, we had on Instagram the beginning of this show before we started so you could see kind of the behind the scenes of what getting ready for the show see all these maniacs getting this shit together but that's where we're at right now so ask some questions i'm going to answer some questions live from you guys too what else do we have all right you ready for the next one yeah let's go okay hello it's kelsey asks uh what advice do you have for working on aggressive behavior i believe it is mostly possessive territorial aggression my golden doodle is very possessive of me and he mm. expresses it in quite an aggressive way. Yeah. This is a common one that, and you're right on the possessive part, by the way. So I'm glad that you at least know that part. So there, there's a lot of people will say, hey, my dog is very protective of me. So there's a very, difference, a very big difference to me between protective and possessive. So for instance, if I'm walking down the street with, let's just say Maddie or Jake or Prince or one of my dogs, they're, they're not gonna be telling people who get close, stay away because they believe me as leader and they know I'm in control of scenario, they trust and respect, I give them direction, I give them protection and direction, so they understand that I'm in control of everything. That being said, if somebody attacks me, they're gonna defend me without a doubt and probably defend me stronger than if I was a back of the pack or I was acting as a follower because now somebody else is going to attack the leader, which is a big deal in the dog world. So that's the difference between protection and possession. So to me, that part of it, there's not really, a lot of people when they talk about, about a dog who's being possessive of them, they wanna deal with the possession like in that moment. But 
it's a lot of things that are happening away from the actual moment of them being possessive of the dog, I mean, uh, being possessive of the owner. That's happening in the other, let's just say, 23 and a half hours of the day. So that's what I'm focused on more of than the actual act of a dog like doing that. So we had like a Lhasa Apsu yesterday who was, who was extremely possessive of the owner. Um, where, you know, where Will has bitten, tried to bite me numerous times and all that stuff. That's one where how do we, it became like, how do we deal with this possession? It's not dealing with that possession. Eventually we have to do it with the owner there and all that stuff. But to me, I wanted to see the entire blueprint of what are they doing throughout the day? What's happening? And, and to not so much of a surprise, dog slept, sleeps with them, allowed on all the furniture, uh, not being fulfilled enough for, with exercise. Uh, barks and demands things, tons of affection at all different states of mind. So the, the main things that I would tell, what's the girl's name again? Or we don't know, it's a username. Uh, Kelsey. Kelsey. So Kelsey, the main thing that I would tell you is to go back to the basics, go back to the formula. Number one, I would start reducing affection a lot. So look at affection is like playing hard to get back in the day in high school. I know I definitely did it. And I know girls definitely did that shit to me too, which is not the most fun, but... If you think about it, if, if we're just giving affection all the time, and here, take affection, take affection, take, take affection, it doesn't become very valuable. It's really like a supply and demand thing. So if I'm giving affection all the time, no matter where, oh, I love you, I love you, and coming into mint space and petting and petting and petting, the dog is very used to it. They're like, who gives a shit about affection? This, this human gives it to me all the time, to the point where some dogs will even get affection so much that they correct the, the owners and say, I don't want affection right now, it's too much. So I would definitely drastically reduce affection and save it for the moments where the dog is being very calm and being very respectful and doing something for you. The other things I would do is, is make sure um, you start detaching yourself a little bit in the home. So practice something like a place command where you're sitting and watching TV, so instead of the dog being on your lap or right next to you, you can have the dog go lay on a bed over there and deal with itself individually. So, it's, so they start understanding that, that you can experience life and go through life without, um, without the need to have the dog be right next to you and protect you at all times. So remember that the possession thing also comes from insecurity a lot of times, and your energy is definitely gonna affect that. So when you take away your energy of, of let's just say a human is coming, Towards, towards you, a lot of times what happens is you start going, oh shit, here comes a human, right? So that energy goes right through the leash to the dog and the dog says, where? Oh, this human causes you to get nervous? Good, it makes me nervous too. Let me go after this person. So the real conversation that you're having is this person is gonna cause my golden doodle to react, right? That, that's what the human is thinking. So Kelsey's walking down the street, she sees a person and she says, shit, here comes this human who's gonna cause my dog to react. The dog is retaking it as, here comes a human that makes me nervous, the dog, and it also makes my human, who's a follower, nervous as well. So that becomes a major threat that we have to keep away at all costs. So the way you're gonna change this whole thing is create the leadership. So you have to be able to, your dog needs to be able to believe you that they can trust and respect you in all scenarios, that you're gonna provide protection for the dog and then you're gonna provide direction of telling him or her what to do in those moments. So it's gonna be a little bit of a process, but, but I would focus on first in the home, your own life, away from people and all that stuff and really come up with a good structured schedule. Make sure your dog's getting sufficient structured exercise. You're practicing waiting at thresholds, waiting at doorways, um, walking next to you on leash, on a loose leash. You can take the dog for, for good exercise, biking, rollerblading, treadmill, stuff to really drain the energy. Then you're gonna focus on the structure part of everything. So place command, like I said, waiting at the doorways, all that stuff. And then the affection part, you're making sure you're giving it, you're reducing it drastically right now because you're in a phase of, of, of changing positions of you guys, right? So this is more of like a transitional period where you want to bring it down pretty low and only save it for the really good things. And then as time goes on and your dog starts believing you as a leader, starts trusting you and respecting you, then you can start increasing it to a point where it's more gonna be your maintenance level. So that would be my recommendation for the possessive thing. Yeah. That's good. A very common one, by the way. Super common one that we see. That was one yesterday with the, with the Lhasa Apsu where I was sitting on the ground with the dog, with the dog probably how far, like 20 feet away? Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, the, the human, like 20 feet away. The dog was sitting next to me, I was touching it, putting my hand on it, relaxing it, and the dog was just whining and crying, trying to get back to the owner. 
as soon as the dog got back to the owner, when we, we, so we waited for the dog to finally settle. Here's another one really quick with that, by the way. So I was holding the dog, he's whining, crying because he's gotten results doing that. So he whines and cries and then he gets to the owner or he gets his food or he gets to go outside. So he knew that whining, crying, being excited gets him a result and it works for him. So we were just showing him another way. So once he calmed down and relaxed and laid down, then the owner came back in and, and was able to see the dog. But as soon as we gave the, owner, the dog back to the owner, excitement triggered, jumping all over, trying to claim. So we worked on that with the owner. I walked away and now me standing like 15 feet away, just standing there, when meanwhile I was sitting with the dog, touching the dog, petting the dog, me standing 15 feet away, the dog with his eyes laser beam on me, growling at me, even if I move my feet. So it shows you how much a human can influence a scenario and how much we can turn a dog into honestly like a weapon by us showering affection and not really focusing on a dog's needs. Most of the time these issues come because humans, number one, they don't know what to do. So that's my goal with this podcast and the lives and all this shit. It's to, to let you guys know because I don't think a lot of people are wrong. I think they just don't know what to do. So that's why I'm sharing all this stuff. So the main thing is, is in that scenario, of teaching that dog that it doesn't need to protect, it doesn't need to possess, it doesn't need to do that. She's not somebody, because she's standing there saying, I don't need this stuff, but she showered the dog with affection and did all this, the things of, of not fulfilling the dog's instinctual needs and instead fulfilling her own emotional needs. So it's a very common one that people get a dog because they want to be able to pet the dog. They want to be able to uh, play with the dog. They want to do all the things they want to do but they forget about a dog. It's an animal who has specific instinctual needs. So we have to provide, so my, my people say, what's the secret? The real secret for me is, let me fulfill the dog's instinctual needs first, every freaking day, which is why we start here in the morning for all the dogs, the boarding trains, the boarding dogs, my dogs, two hour walk to start the day. We're practicing exercise, discipline, and affection on the walk every single day. Exercise, structure, affection, whatever you want to call it. We do it every single day on the walk. So that's how we start the day. So I, I, I fulfill their instinctual needs. Then I go to my emotional needs, which is I'm able to pet them and be with me and look at the dog and laugh and do the funny things and all the stuff that people love to do. But just make sure you do. I'm not saying you can't pet dogs and have fun with them. Just do their instinctual needs first. Okay. Paula actually is on Facebook and said that Charlie did awesome on his walks today. That's great. I love it. It's amazing. Way to go, Paul. I love that shit. It's so good. I love hearing this stuff of like, like all these people who, who, who I've worked with who are, who didn't, it's people who just didn't know what to do. So, so many, this is what bothers me. And, and Paula also like had, has been through numerous trainers. And one of the things she shared with us was that a lot of the trainers like either A, didn't really handle shit, like they didn't help her, they kind of like danced around the subject because this guy had some, some issues and all that stuff. But then there's also people who make them feel wrong. So like, and, and kind of like, are like, you did this, you did that. To me, that's insecurity speaking because those people don't really know how to help the dog in that moment. So they're just blaming the owner for doing it wrong. Why the fuck are we blaming an owner for doing it wrong if they don't know what to do? Uh, that, that to me is just ludicrous stuff. So instead of blaming an owner saying it's you, your fault, blah, 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 and bringing the owner down, those people need to be brought up and tell them they can do it. I know you just didn't know these things. You can, let me teach you what to do so you understand. Because where does confidence come from? It comes from education so you know what to do and then repetitions. Really, that's what it is. And having the courage to just take that one step forward. I did that video on the, uh, with me doing the jujitsu thing that I did on with these guys, Hiro and Adam did a video of me when I was practicing jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu scared the shit out of me because I was like, well, I don't know how to roll around the gr ground and grab guys and try to submit them and all that stuff. It, it just made me like, I was like, I don't know what to do with this. But then I had that moment of just taking that step forward of courage, which is not the most pleasant thing to deal with, but on the other side of that courage and that step forward and that kind of like, that uh, the uncomfortable feeling, I was conquering a little piece of fear and then that actually starts building, building confidence. The more and more that I do that. So now I've become obsessive. Back in, my, back in the day, what I used to do was I would act like, oh, that doesn't scare me. And meanwhile, in my own head, in front of the mirror by myself, I'm like, oh, it does scare the shit out of me. I don't know what I'm going to do with that thing. But I was doing it for everybody else to look like I was all like confident and I got all that shit. 
It's, it's a loser mentality. It doesn't work. So instead now I've become obsessive of like things that make me a little bit like, oh shit, what's, what, what's the deal with that? I'm like, I need to go explore that and see that because now it becomes an opportunity for me to pass that and to pass that fear or, or get past that thing. And it's another like notch of confidence that comes with it. So to me, it's about building up the clients, really teaching them uh, the education. So like in jujitsu, the, 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 the guy, Chris at the UFC gym, amazing teacher that I have there. He, he teaches me all the steps. This is how it's going to go. This is how you put the gi on. This is how you tie the belt. All right. This is how we do when we roll, we go this speed, we do all that stuff. I want everyone to, to, so I'm doing the same thing with my clients. I'm showing them here. This is how we put the leash on when the dog does this, we put this amount of pressure. I'm working with them, not not bringing them down and punishing them and then like leaving them like with big question marks. Like you got to help these people. So for the trainers watching this stuff, it's, it's really about going in there with, an, with, with a calm approach, looking at what the situation, assessing and evaluating the situation, coming up with a strategy and then educating the owner, showing them hands on how it's done, working with the dog and then being there for support over and over and over and over again. That's really what it comes down to. So. That's really it for that shit. I know Adam's giving me this. That means that we have to wrap it up. I'm getting yelled at because I have to go now yes, to go to deal session. with some dog who wants to bite everybody. So I'm looking forward to that. It's always fun. So we're wrapping it up or what? Yes. This is exciting. I'm so pumped to be back. We're going to start filming way more of these because this is like what I really like. And this gets back to the last thing I'm going to say is quickly. Yeah, quickly. I promise is doing what excites you. So as I've been posting more material about like, like people like going for it and doing what they want to do in life and not going by what society tells them, people say like, like, but how do I know what to do? What do I do? Go try shit is what I'm saying. Go do things and see what happens. Like you can totally have your job that you have now. And then in the other hours of the day, start exploring things, testing things out. And if it's excite, here's the real formula. If it's something that you love, if it excites you, and you have some talent at it and you're willing to work hard at it, you're fucking going to get that shit. It's like, it's out there. This is America. Like it's, it's so out there that like there, that when you find that thing, it almost becomes like, wow, like my, my biggest stress in life right now is like, wow, there's so much opportunity out there. And like, you, you see, you guys see this every day. It's like, there's so much opportunity out there that I don't even know what to do with it. Like what, all right, should we do like the uh, board and train? How much, where should we go? Like, should we do a workshop? Should we do, there's so much opportunity, but you got to find what it is. So there might be 79 things that you try that you're like, mm, one of those things didn't work out for me. So I actually don't have the talent that I thought I had in that, or I'm not seeing results like I thought I would. So let me try the next thing. Let me try the next thing. So it never becomes a failure unless you just give up and say, fuck it, I'm going back to my old thing. I give up. You're going to find that all it takes is one thing and you're like, wow, I actually enjoy this. I like this. This is fun. This is like, excites me. I love it. And I'm good at it. So do it. And then you get better and better and grow upon it. And, and, and every day, take a step to, to compare yourself to where you were the day before instead of comparing yourself to fucking somebody else. Who cares about what everyone else is doing? I don't, I'm not comparing myself to Adam, to Jamie, to Cass. To, we're all on our own journeys in life. We're all here to support each other. Go for it. Go hard. Figure it out. And you're going to really have a fulfilling life. All right, guys. I'm pumped to be back doing the Pack Leader Show. We're going to do more of these things. This is really exciting. I love this shit so much. So we'll see you guys soon. Uh, episode four, we'll do episode five, hopefully like not three months later and maybe like a day later. So I want to be able to bring you guys multiple sessions per week like this. So we're, we're, we're putting it into the schedule, I promise. And by the way, if it doesn't happen, blame Jamie. So you can start all texting her and emailing her because she's the one who has to manage this shit. There you go. I'm responsible for <laughs> That's schedule. That's it. All right, guys. Awesome podcast. Uh, stay calm and confident, and we'll see you guys soon. Bye.